In Homestead, Pennsylvania, someone is raping elderly women in the dead of night. That was a despicable crime. Certainly a lot of fear. Police have clues, but no suspects. Somebody that we knew and that was just getting off watching us. Then a psychic has a vision of the attacks. Horrible violence and screaming. And the attacker. This guy was like Spider-Man. She also makes a chilling prediction. We were going to have a murder rather than a vicious assault. Can her mysterious visions help the police to catch a rapist before he becomes a killer? Homestead, Pennsylvania, a small neighborly town on the outskirts of Pittsburgh. You knew the next door neighbors so well, they were like your own family. A town built on steel. Armor for tanks, armor for the ships. We, we were very much an important part of World War II and Homestead. But in the mid-1980s, U.S. Steel is leaving Homestead, and with it, 15,000 jobs disappear. It sort of was like a death blow to Homestead. And something else is unraveling the fabric of this close-knit community. A rapist is attacking elderly women in their own homes in the dead of night. It's like somebody raped my mother. The first assault took place on August 10, 1983. An 86-year-old woman living alone is attacked and raped in her bedroom. Detective Tom Hobart is the first officer on the scene. Most people in the town knew each other. If you didn't know them, you knew family members. You, you, you knew someone associated with their family. That was a despicable crime. We'd take a lead and we would exhaust that lead. We worked that case for a number of years and it seemed like at everything we were doing, we were running into dead ends. No arrest is made and the case goes cold. But two years later, a 61-year-old woman is raped in her second floor bedroom, a carbon copy of the first assault. I was born and raised in this town. The first two victims I knew personally. Now, these are our folks. These are our people. We knew them. We knew their sons, their daughters. People tend to forget. They didn't immediately associate the two crimes. We, however, associated immediately just because of the MO, if you will. Though police know the rapes are connected, they have no suspect. The victim never saw anything. The victim would awake with him placing something over their face, whether it was a pillow, a blanket, whatever he could. But he always covered their face. We knew fingerprints matched, but we couldn't match them to anybody at the time. We had serology matches and pubic hair samples. Forensics evidence told us that he was a black male. We knew he was a rather large man. The victims, when they would describe, they'd actually use their hands and say, you know, I grabbed him and his arms were big. You take a small area that is saturated with dogs and none of the dogs barked. We knew that this individual responsible lived in the immediate neighborhood. He was probably a younger man because his method of entering these homes. He had to be strong, he had to be agile. Forensically, we had the evidence from the very beginning. We just didn't have a suspect. But you gotta imagine, other crimes go on. We're a small town, a small department, so we had to pull resources as we needed, and we couldn't let the rest of the town suffer because of these incidents. The rapist leaves clues, but the police still have no suspects, and there is no arrest. Then, 18 months later, a third attack. A 75-year-old widow raped in her second floor bedroom. Evidence was pointing to one person that they realized they had a serial rapist on their hands. The, the interviewing the women uh, broke your heart. It was very, very embarrassing for them to sit down and talk to me. I was a young, young man. It just became very personal. Saving this community was our mission. The frustration that set in from not being able to find the assailant. I, I don't think Hobart went home for a week. I mean, I, he, when he did go home, I had to order him home. With the culprit still at large, Detective Hobart does something unusual. His brother met a psychic at a party and suggests she might be able to help. He's very skeptical of, of psychics, and, and he had went to a party in the Greensburg area, uh, where Nancy's from, and uh, he had met her at the party, and that she was a psychic, and she did a couple neat things that he thought were were pretty neat. We chased all of our forensic leads now. We hit dead ends with those. When you ask a policeman how to do something, you get a police response. Policemen think the same way. We may as well get someone in from the outside who can give us a new perspective. Whether it was good information or bad information, it was gonna be new information. And when he gave me this idea, I thought, why not? 
you know, I kind of fluffed it off at first, and then I realized, you know, he's serious. And I said, hey, let's, let's go for it. Uh, see what can happen. It certainly couldn't hurt. Nancy Meyer is a psychic who specializes in what she calls ranging. What I usually use when I'm working on a case is the environment itself. The whole environment absorbs what happened. It runs as a movie, but I'm in it, and I can pull the information out. I contact Nancy, and I, I ask Nancy if, if she could meet with me, maybe provide me with whatever she could do to help. Give me a time, and I'll be there, because these women who were being assaulted were the age of my own mother. I had hoped that Nancy would come in and say, here we go, this is the guy you're looking for, let's go knock on his door, and I'd open the door, and I'd arrest him, and the case would be over. That's not what happened. But before the psychic gets a chance to meet the detective, there is another rape, just two weeks after the third. A 64-year-old woman is viciously assaulted in her second floor bedroom, but police still have no one in their sights. When they finally meet, Detective Hobart tells the psychic nothing about the case. I, I wanted her to be able to come in and tell me something, not me tell her. She did request it, that her and I walk the general area because she said that she would get a better read, a better vibrations on, on what she was looking for. I walked several steps behind Nancy and let Nancy lead the way. As they walk through the two-block area where all four of the rapes occurred, Nancy Meyer appears to tune in on the crimes. Several times, she stopped right in front of one of the homes and would say, I'm getting some bad feelings from this house. The assaults were so bad, it came right through the walls of the house. Okay. Somehow, Nancy Meyer is able to pinpoint information that only the police knew. Remarkably, she is able to tell the detective in which homes the attacks occurred picking the homes where the assaults took place. It was uncanny. She was saying things that, that no one told her, but I knew to be fact already. And now, Nancy claims she can see the actual attacks. In the images, I saw that he was African-American. It was his neighborhood. He knew the streets. He knew how to get from one house to the other. He even recognized the people. And then I'd be looking up at the side of the house, realizing this guy was like Spider-Man. He climbed drain pipes, he went up the sides of houses. He was going in second story windows. He clearly enjoyed the risk. As to how that entry was made were very, very accurate, as if she almost knew what, what had taken place. He would come in the window, and he would stand for a while looking at his victim sleeping. And it was very clear by the time I got to the fourth property, that I was picking up the exact same thought patterns on every single one of those properties. There was no deviation. But what she tells the detective next is something he didn't know. It was a street light, and as he turned to look to the street, I got a good, sh a good visual of his face. So I asked her, I said, could you, if you could draw, could you draw him? And she said, yeah. And I said, holy sh well, well, holy hell, we got the break we've been hunting for. But is it enough to stop a serial rapist before he strikes again? In Homestead, Pennsylvania, a faceless rapist is targeting elderly women in their homes. Stymied, the police call in a psychic for help. Whether it was good information or bad information, it was going to be new information. Who claims to see the attacker's face. And as he turned, I got a good visual of his face. Something no one up to now had been able to do. We got the break we've been hunting for. Because Nancy's psychic description of the rapist is so specific, Detective Hobart brings in a police sketch artist. He's got a broad face and the eyes. Mainly we use composites and sketch artists to eliminate people more so than who it is, it's who it isn't. Most people have seen the overlays that, that are... We actually had a sketch artist that, that did the drawings. Um, he changed whatever Nancy was feeling it wasn't right, uh, he changed. He has uh, this leather hat. Every time I visualize him, he has this hat on. Normal practice is to remove anything like a hat from the sketch so as to focus on the suspect's features, but producing a police sketch based on the word of a psychic is anything but normal. I'm off to the side. I have nothing to do with Nancy explaining the sketch artist. I'm just accompanying her, and it's a long day. The hat's not right. You have to move the hat this way. You have to move. I was becoming frustrated, and the sketch artist was becoming frustrated. It, it, it's a hat. It's a hat. You know, it's, but no, a hat had to be a certain way. But we got in an argument over the hat. You don't put a hat on a sketch. 
this is against protocol. You don't do it. And I said, yes, but if people are to recognize him, the hat has to be on him because he's never without it. As far as a, a clue that we were, you know, we were going to go out and everybody had a hat on, and it, it, that wasn't the, the, the situation. A lot of people wear hats. Nancy explained a black leather cap, and she had it over and over. I felt sorry for the sketch artist how many times she made him change that hat. And we told our officers, look, this is not an official wanted poster. This is not something that a victim of a crime has produced. This came from, from Nancy, a, a psychic. And as most people have seen sketch artists, they're never going to be a photograph. But we were still looking at this saying, hey, it's better than what we had. A very broad nose at the bottom. But before the psychic sketch is even circulated, the rapist strikes yet again. April 24, 1987, just five weeks after the last attack, a 76-year-old widow is assaulted in her home. Each one escalated that he became much more aggressive. The entire town is on edge. Not panic, but it was certainly a lot of fear. We had now formed an actual task force where we were on the streets every day. So there were a lot of tired policemen from Allegheny County and the sheriff's departments. With the attacks intensifying, police ask the psychic for help again. But this time, she takes a different approach. And I said, I think we need to get ahead of this guy and start using my abilities to figure out where he's going to target next. And as we crossed over one street, um, I could pick up this man walking around late at night, checking out when people's lights were going off. And I noticed that he was on this street quite a bit. And I said to Tommy, this has to be near where he's living because I keep sensing him. And what the psychic says next is the last thing that police wanted to hear. Nancy said, we have to get this guy. We're going to have to get him soon because we were going to have a murder rather than a vicious assault. And with the psychic's next revelation, the investigation takes an astonishing turn. And I felt him checking a house out particularly closely. And she said, this is not one of your victims, but I'm getting some bad energy coming from this house. Do you know who lives here? There was no indication of the house that who lived there. There was no special signs on the door or anything like that. It looked like any other house in the neighborhood. So when she picked that out, it, it raised the hair on my neck because there was no reason for Nancy to be able to pick that particular house out and not knowing anything about the resident of the house. However, I knew that that was a relative of the chief's. For Police Chief Kelly, the case has just become up close and personal. He takes the psychic's warning seriously and stakes out his grandmother's house. I got my German Shepherd. Tell him to come on. Bring, bring it on. When you're sitting there in the silence waiting for something brutal to come in, you knew that probably it was going to be a life or death situation. You're aware of every single sound in the night. You can hear your heart pound. The adrenaline takes over. And you're crushed when any of these ladies are victimized the way they were. And it's personal. But the chief's grandmother isn't the next to fall prey to the rapist. Two weeks after Nancy's chilling prediction on a hot June night, an 86-year-old woman living just yards from the chief's grandmother becomes victim number six. I was devastated. It was at a lady's house who shared the same alley and the same ethnic last name. In fact, they were related. It was like, ha ha, I know you're here. I can still do it. Despite working night and day, police appear no closer to capturing this elusive predator. Many times, I would get up out of bed, come to Homestead, hide in an alley, sit in a car, sit on the side of the road, hoping that I would see something. The police were passing out boat horns for the women, 200 of them, in fact, so that they could blow a horn and at least have the police come because they were loud horns. They were advising people to buy dogs. We were doing everything humanly possible. The residents were living in a lockdown fear. It wasn't a community that has whole house air conditioning. It was hot, it was summertime, it was blazing hot. They couldn't open a window and put a fan in the window for fear that someone would crawl through that window. They, they lived in jail while the perpetrator was probably walking around watching us. And we had to catch this guy. I was riding up the hill and I saw this 
elderly lady that I knew uh, carrying some grocery bags up the hill. And I stopped and I says, come on, get in, I'll ride you home, it's just too hot. And you shouldn't be walking in this hot day, you know. It gave her a little bit of hell. And when I dropped her off at her house, I personally had said to her, check your windows and be, just be careful. And she says, okay, you know. I just walked into the station and Chief Kelly said, we had another rape yesterday. And I said, oh man, like who was it? And he mentioned the name and it was a lady that I had taken up the hill. Despite the mayor's warning, on August 25th, the 76-year-old lady became the seventh victim. It was two months after the sixth attack, but this time the violence has escalated to a dangerous level. Fear has gripped Homestead, Pennsylvania. A serial rapist is preying on elderly women and police seem powerless to stop him. These are our people, we knew them. Chased all our forensic leads now. We hit dead ends with those. The frustration had set in. Psychic Nancy Meyer is helping with the investigation. She's certain if not caught soon, the rapist will turn killer. We were gonna have a murder rather than a vicious assault. At the scene of the last rape, they had found a large knife on the steps of her home that he had threatened to cut her throat if she didn't stop fighting. We were convinced 100% that we were dealing with somebody that we knew and that was just getting off watching us. But it was, again, looking for that proverbial needle in a haystack. He wasn't going to appear to be public enemy number one. He was going to appear to be a, a nice young man. With the investigation hitting a wall, Detective Hobart again contacts the psychic. After the last victim, Nancy and I spoke again. I was eating, sleeping, and drinking this case, along with other officers. I wasn't the only officer doing that. I'm sure that my frustrations of, of being unable to, to locate this guy were starting to show. When I said, Tommy, you're gonna have him by next week. It's gonna be over with. You're gonna arrest him. You won't need me anymore. I'll believe that when I see it. And, uh, but he said, gee, I hope you're right. I said, I hope I'm right. I hope this nightmare's over with. And then, the break the entire town has been waiting for. None of our victims had anything ever taken from them until our last victim. One of those items was a shotgun. Phone rang, it's three o'clock in the morning. It was a guy I know, and he said, I know who, who you're hunting for. I said, come on. They took a shotgun last night, didn't they? We never publicized that. Never. And he said, it's over Steel City Arms over in Braddock. The guy's trying to sell it. I can set it up for you. The informant sets up the buy, and the police, armed with the psychic sketch, stake out the pawn shop and wait. When the suspect arrives and takes back possession of the gun, the police are there to arrest him. And I had the sketch sitting next to me on the seat. And he turned and kind of looked at me. I said, this was like a photograph of this guy. And of course, at the time, my belief in the psychics went sky high. When he did return and when he did take back custody of the shotgun, they were there to arrest him on a charge of receiving stolen property. And to this point, they didn't have his fingerprints. We brought him into the police department, Mirandized him, his rights, rolled his fingerprints, we had a district attorney there advising us to make sure that every move we made was calculated, that there's not gonna be any mistakes. This man is gonna go to trial. There's not gonna be any motions to suppress. There's not gonna be any technicalities to walk on. We called a uh, fingerprint expert. Uh, when he prepared the prints, he just looked up and said, gentlemen, it's over. You would have thought everybody in the room would have been high-fiving or yelling or screaming wasn't a sound in the room. Matched the fingerprints and all the forensic evidence on down the line matched. After four years and seven vicious attacks, the man arrested is 22-year-old Dennis Foy. Unemployed, Foy lived with his parents on the same block where one of the rapes occurred. Foy's arrest in the fall of 1987 came after his case received not only local, but national publicity. I think my feeling is for the victims. And, uh... They're through it, so am I. I. Thank God that these uh, women that were raped were heroes enough to go to court. You saw three widows and a woman who had never married 
who had told police she, in fact, had been a virgin, a 76-year-old woman, had to testify in detail. A year later at his trial, Foy faced the women he violated. In court, the jury hear the intimate details of Foy's trail of terror. He knew his victims and staked out their homes, waiting for his chance. He broke in by scaling the side of a house and entering through a second floor window. Inside, he attacked the defenseless women and stifled their cries for help with a pillow or whatever else was nearby. Sometimes he tied their feet and hands. He threatened his final victim with a knife. The judge described his acts as unspeakable. Foy is convicted on all counts and receives 100 years in maximum security prison. With no inside knowledge, how could psychic Nancy Meyer have known so much about this case? She knew the attacker was African American, lived in the neighborhood, and knew his victims. Through her psychic ranging, she described how he entered each home through the second story window, and she correctly predicted when the investigation would be over. And what about that hat? When Dennis Foy was arrested, he wore a hat eerily similar to the one Nancy had the sketch artist draw. If you're gonna put a hat on somebody, you put a hat on, whatever. But she was, she wanted it tilted a certain way. She wanted it to be, to, to cover a certain part, you know, the head. The things that, that amazed me is she hit so many things right. And the last thing was the hat. She just had, the hat was just, it was there. It was the way she described it and painstakingly described it. Today, Homestead, Pennsylvania is bouncing back from economic downturn. We haven't bounced back to where we should be, but we had a developer that bought the U.S. Steel property. Right now, it's called the waterfront. But no one can forget those five years when one man held an entire community hostage. You know, these acts affect a lot of people. Thank goodness they caught them. Who knows what the next step might have been. You'll never lose that feeling, you know. You'll never lose the feeling that you could have done more for these people. Just just to do it for, for fun, I don't think so. It's not fun ranging assaults like that. There's nothing fun about it. But when it gets results, then it's worth it. She said we would have them, and it wasn't shortly thereafter that we did. So you explain it. <laughs>